Now I'm going to click the button. And we're live now. And uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the Topos Institute Colloquium. Today, we're very pleased and honored to have Jonathan Sterling uh, with us. And today, he's going to be talking about synthetic domains in the 21st century. Uh, John, whenever you're ready. Thanks. Um, uh, thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak uh, in this colloquium. Uh, I've spent many hours watching the talks uh, that um, other people have given, and so it's it's really a great pleasure to be able to give my own here. Um, so our story begins in uh, 1949 when Alan Turing presented what one might call one of the first correctness proofs for an actual computer program, uh, which was some kind of addition checker. Um, and uh, I'll tell you what he said. So he asked, how can one check a routine in the sense of making sure that it's right? Uh, in order that the person who checks may not have too difficult a task, the programmer should make a number of definite assertions which can be checked individually and from which the correctness of the whole program easily follows. Um, I wanted to point out that um, in this uh, very interesting report during um, uh, had three ideas which were later perhaps independently but which later became very important in the area of program verification first was the idea of compositionality of deducing uh, something from a larger uh, about a larger program by deducing independent things about its uh, components um, next was the idea of annotating programs with local assertions that that uh, make some kind of a statement about what is going on in the computer at a given point in the execution process. And um, finally, uh, another interesting idea that came out in this, in this report, although which I think was later independently invented by other people, is the idea of invariance that cut across the entire execution of the program, uh, which now form a very important tool when you're trying to verify the correctness of a program. Um, and I wanted to start with that because I think that what programming language theorists do as a whole is really about trying to give a precise and reliable meaning to the assertions in Turing's verified edition checker. Um, uh, so just to like, why is that not trivial? Like just to give an example that looks very trivial, um, you can think of a program, um, maybe the so the program has, uh, you know, set X to two times X and then it prints X. And in between the lines, we've added some little assertions that should speak about um, the state, uh, the state of the program as it advances through those instructions. So at first, maybe a precondition is that X is an integer. Um, and then uh, we can set X to two times X and then, okay, well now it should be an even integer because if you multiply something by two, then it becomes even no matter what. And printing X shouldn't change what is stored inside X. So it should still be an even integer. And so this looks pretty simple, but the thing is it's actually not, um, this is just text. So what does a variable like X actually refer to? Certainly it does not refer to a mathematical variable. Uh, mathematical variables can't change like that in the flow. Um, so that would be something we need to make precise. But another thing that you would need to make precise is what does two times five refer to? I mean, two and five are just symbols in the computer and, and uh, symbols in the computer are not the same as, as numbers, um, not the same as integers. This is just expressions. So all of this stuff has to be made precise. And maybe you know how to make it precise, but the reason I'm bringing this up is someone had to come up with a way to make it precise. Someone had to give precise mathematical meaning to these things. And if you want to give precise mathematical meaning to an assertion like X is an even integer, um, you also have to give precise mathematical meaning to the program expressions that the assertions are about. So this program of, uh, of uh, uh, verifying programs by saying what they mean um, is really about both explaining the program expressions and also explaining what the meanings of the assertions are that we make about them. And so denotational semantics is a particular approach to doing this that explains the meaning of a complex program, one that is composed from, from smaller parts in terms of the meanings of those smaller parts. Um, and here we, we see again Turing's compositional, compositionality criterion. And then the idea is that once you've explained what the meanings of these things are, then um, the predicates or the assertions can be explained um, by looking at some kind of um, uh, some kind of a predicate on the mathematical objects that these programs or program components denote. Um, 
And so at first, this is very easy. Um, so um, just to give an example of how we might teach um, a student how to give meanings of this nature to a very simple programming language, like simply type lambda calculus or something like that. Well, a context or a type in syntax, it refers to a set in, in a simple, simple minded semantics that we could teach to a student. And a program it refers to a function between the sets that, uh, that the uh, context and the type uh, refer to. So I, I don't know how familiar everyone is with programming language notation. This just means that M is a well-typed program that whose environment is gamma and, and it produces an element of type tau. Um, and an assertion, so if, if we're asserting phi, and phi is mentioning uh, uh, variables that are drawn from gamma, um, then it should refer to a subset of some kind, a subset of the set that gamma refers to. And an entailment of assertions, that should refer to an inclusion of subsets. And the reason this works really well for, um, for getting people started with thinking about how to reason about their code is that we already know how to reason with sets. Sets are just collections. Um, we've taught from both how to think about those things, whether it's counting or matching or whatever. And so we know how to think about these in a, in a naive but reliable way. We're not reliant on like formal symbolic reasoning for this stuff. We just know how to think about it. And that's of course always the goal for a mathematical abstraction, something that we know how to naively think about. Um, but in reality, things are much harder than that because programs have a lot of features in them that are not easy to explain using simple things like sets or collections. So programs have recursion. You can have a program that is recursive, but you can also have a type that is recursive. Programs interact with the computer's memory. Um, and so this, the example I showed at the beginning, in fact, is a perfect example of that. And sometimes they interact with the computer's memory in very complex ways. Um, programs are polymorphic, meaning that a program is not defined just for a specific type tau, but it may be defined over, you know, uh, generically over many different possible types. Um, some programs are, are non-deterministic. They don't do the same thing every time you run them. And programs can be interactive. So you get the picture. Sets are too discrete to explain this. And so we have needed to view programs as more complex kinds of collections in order to deal with this. And uh, for me, the starting point of solving this problem is uh, Dana, who is with us today, Dana's domain theory, um, which uh, gives answers to many, many of these questions. Um, so the idea of domains for denotational semantics is to replace sets with some kind of a space, um, which I'm being very loose about right now, uh, means I want to uh, not fix a technical notion, uh, which we'll call a domain. And uh, what we'll need from that is that the points of the space have some kind of a specialization uh, pre-order in which if you have an ascending chain in that pre-order, you can, you can find a supremum or a colement of that chain. Um, and so now the story actually is, is very similar to what we had before. So a context or, or a type tau refers to a space or a domain. And a program is a function, but it's a continuous function, which is the right kind of function between spaces. In a recursive program, uh, uh, something involving a fixed point, it refers to a colon of the standard chain that you get by, by iterating the function on, on a, um, an undefined element. And then assertions, well, this, gets, this is where it starts to get a bit more complex. There's a lot of options um, that you can consider. Um, uh, and all of these are technical in different ways and no one, uh, no, no one choice here will solve all your problems. But um, there's a, so there's a lot of options here. Um, so the uh, classical domain theory didn't, it didn't solve every problem. Um, one of the problems that it created, um, although maybe this would be, uh, I would consider this part of the richness of the field, um, but for someone who's just trying to write the program and verify it, maybe it is a downside, is that there were a lot of different variations on domains. There's, there's omega directed complete partial orders, um, omega complete partial orders, Scott domains, strongly algebraic domains, and different variations of all of these. And, you, you can't do without, you know, all but one. All of them do something important. Um, 
uh, another issue is that um, when working with these things, it's often the case that you have to prove, uh, you know, some complicated continuity side condition for some function because not just any function will do, you need continuous functions and so on. Um, uh, the other issue I mentioned is that there's uh, no intrinsic notion of assertion. There's many different kinds of assertion. And um, I, I don't think you can solve that by saying, oh, there's only one kind of assertion, but you do need some kind of a unifying framework in order to, um, uh, to make sense of what's going on there. And then a problem that I, I don't think it should be considered like a, uh, like a, you know, oh, domain is bad because it doesn't have dependent type. But um, today, dependently typed proof assistants and programming languages are becoming increasingly important. And for that reason, um, it would be good to have denotational semantics that supports programming with dependent types. Um, and uh, this has been very difficult in the context of classical domain theory, although there have been some very interesting domain theoretic models of dependent type theory. Um, but the reason dependent types are important to me and to many programmers in the 21st century is that uh, you can you can reason about your program as if it were as, as if it were a function between sets, and you can do all the constructions of set theory in type theory. Um, but without dependent types, you need like these stratified languages, a language of assertions to be separate from a language of programs, and so on. Um, and then, of course, there's the fact that uh, to solve many problems in semantics caused by the very sophisticated features that modern programming languages have, like uh, state, where you can have where you can store in memory other functions, not just uh, numbers and strings, um, uh, parametric polymorphism, concurrency, and so on. These have all necessitated the introduction of new kinds of domain, new kinds of space. Um, for instance, event structures and the generalization as pre-sheet topo and so on are all new kinds of space that um, uh, have been needed in order to deal with these problems in, in the setting of domain theory. Um, so um, perhaps Dana will, will correct me on the history, but my understanding is that um, uh, things have got pretty complex and obscure and uh, in the 1980s, and it was time to find a way to use advances in topos theory to enable informal, naive reasoning about programs and types. Uh, where you can think of the programs like functions between special kinds of sets. And the idea would be that instead of having uh, domains and continuous functions between them, where you always, um, and having these be some kind of the function, a function between domains is, is, is not just the function between the sets, it's also the fact that it is continuous. Instead of having a situation like that, you would instead have a, have a category of sets, so a mathematical universe of sets, in which the domains are just special sets, and then arbitrary functions between them are the programs. Um, and Topos theory provided tools, um, tools to do this, um, because, uh, for instance, you can take a category of domains and use the Oneda embedding to turn it into a Topos in which the uh, certain of these sets inside the Topos behave like domains and so on. Um, and the nice, uh, nice thing about synthetic domain theory as a program is that um, it, it brings order to many questions that were a bit complex. And there's an intrinsic notion of dependent type. Not every dependent type is a domain, but you can still use them. Um, and so there have been a lot of attempts to axiomatize this uh, topos theoretic or dependent type theoretic version of domain theory. Um, and uh, each of these axiomatizations has its own merits, but I'll focus on one. I don't know if all the specific axioms that I'm saying have actually appeared before, but um, uh, in the same place, but this is what I'll tell you. So if you have an elementary topos S with a natural numbers object, um, I'm gonna add some axioms that will allow you to, uh, to talk about programs and types and uh, verification of programs inside that topos. Um, so the first axiom is that there is a, what's called a dominance. And so this was introduced by Pino Rossellini um, uh, in his um, PhD thesis, I think. Um, and, and the idea is that it's a subuniverse of the universe of propositions or the subobject classifier. And it's closed under the true proposition and it's also closed under dependent sums. Um, and um, what the purpose of this is, this is going to play the role of the Sierpinski space in, uh, in the, internal domain theory of the topos. Um, for people who are used to programming, think of it like a map into this would be kind of like making a function into the unit type 
in a language where you're allowed to do general recursion. So it could terminate, it could not terminate, but because we're working abstractly, there could be any number of behaviors here. Um, and what a dominance gives you is it gives you a monad. Um, so you have an operation, which I'll call L for lifting, which takes every type or object in the topos to the, uh, to the collection of partial elements. So elements that are only partially defined and the support is given by an element of the dominance. So an element of LA would be a proposition P or phi that's in the dominance. And then an element of A that is defined only when phi is true. And um, the idea here is that if you choose your dominance properly, um, you'll be able to, um, to do uh, recursive partial programming in this, um, in this setting. Um, so the idea will be that dominance will actually induce a condition on other objects in the topos that will allow you to think of them as the types of a programming language. So one of the axioms that you need is that uh, the dominance is also closed under the false proposition. This corresponds to programs that diverge or elements that are completely undefined. You can also add in other kinds of, uh, other kinds of joins um, uh, to this, um, uh, to this uh, dominance. Um, and uh, we don't need them, but you can add them and they will do interesting things. Um, so for instance, um, if you add uh, binary joins, then you can define a parallel or operation, which is this classic counter example for full abstraction in um, the Scott model of PCF. Um, but we won't talk about that too much today. Um, so now how do we, how do we get to, to recursion? So now we have to do a little bit of category theory. So the lifting operation, which takes a type to its type of partial elements supported by, by the dominance, that operation as a functor um, uh, has an initial algebra, which you can compute. And in, in type theory, you can compute it as, as a W type. Um, uh, yes, um, the idea would be that each node is, is labeled by a proposition and then you have a partial element supported by that proposition, which in the partial element is another one of these things. So that's how it goes by recursion and so on. Um, but geometrically, you can think of this initial algebra as kind of a generic chain, um, a generic omega chain in some sense. And so if we had replaced the dominant sigma with the Boolean, so two, then what we would get would be the natural numbers. It's a very discrete kind of chain, zero, successor, successor, successor. And what's happening here is we have a kind of fattened up chain because it's not the case that every element of sigma need be uh, true or false. There could be other things kind of glued in between them. So it's like a fat, a fat chain. Um, and now if you look at the final co-algebra for this thing, which is a co-inductive type, and you can also compute that in a type theoretic way, um, there, there's a there, there's a canonical map that goes from the initial algebra into the uh, into the final co-algebra uh, between the carriers. And the idea of this map is, if, if the initial algebra was a generic omega chain, then the final co-algebra would be you could think of it as the generic omega chain equipped with a further infinite element that goes beyond all the elements that you've had so far. And so this inclusion, you could think of it as an incidence relation between these two shapes, or you could think of it as the inclusion of finite elements into potentially infinite elements. Um, and this, this map is what allows you to define a notion of, of completeness internally for a type. Uh, what the point of this completeness is, it's going to mean that the type supports recursion in some sense. Um, so, uh, a type will be called complete when it is orthogonal, here I mean internally orthogonal, to this inclusion from omega into omega bar. And what it means to be internally orthogonal is that if you can draw an omega chain in A, then it can be extended to one of these chains that has a spot for the infinite element. And that spot takes you to the, the kind of formal co-limit of the chain. Um, and so the idea would be if you form a chain which is given by iterating a function uh, a bunch of times, if you extend it like this, then you will get, uh, you'll get the fixed point of the function. Um, and so a further axiom, and, and by the way, many of the axioms that people consider are, are much less strong than this and they imply things like this, but I'm just skipping to the end and giving you the thing that you will want to use as a, as a person who's verifying programs. Um, 
So one of the, uh, uh, so an axiom that I will impose is that there's a reflective full uh, subfibration um, in the topos. Uh, so when I say subfibration, it's like a subcategory, except it's stable. It, it exists in the slices and it's stable in the phase change. That's important for type theory. Um, and the important thing about this full subfibration is that every object in it is complete in the sense that I just described, meaning that if you have a omega chain, it can be extended to an omega bar chain. Um, and it's close under the monad L. And you can take the smallest reflective subfibration um, uh, that has these properties, but there's also other ones that you could choose. It doesn't really matter um, for our purposes what you choose. They all have different interesting properties. Um, so just by this definition here, um, the uh, this subcategory or subfibration of so-called pre-domains, that's what we'll call them, it's automatically Cartesian closed. It's automatically uh, complete and co-complete relative to S um, uh, as, as a full subfibration. Um, and uh, the limits are in fact computed just as they are in S. So limit constructions look like naive set constructions. Co-limit constructions, uh, depending on what axioms we assume, they may look more or less, uh, usually less like naive set theoretic constructions. Uh, that's, that's the way it goes with reflective subcategories. And so a domain is then defined to be a predomain equipped with an L algebra structure. And what this does is, well, intuitively, an L algebra structure, it gives you a bottom element. Um, because you can choose, uh, so if you, what it does is it takes partial elements to total elements and the uh, partial element that is nowhere defined must get sent to somewhere and that's gonna be the bottom element of, or the totally undefined element of the domain. And then there's a notion of a linear map between these domains, which is just L algebra homomorphisms. And for people who know some classical domain theory, the idea is that predomains are the same as, or they are abstracting the, unpointed CPOs and domains are abstracting the pointed CPOs. And in fact, you can actually come up with definitions that will cause these identifications to hold exactly. Um, and then finally, um, we'll assume one last axiom, which is that the Kleisley category for this monad on predomains is algebraically compact in a fibered sense. I'm not going to uh, delve into the technical meaning of this, but basically this means that you can compute recursive types too. Um, so we have the ability to compute recursive functions by defining maps out of, um, uh, by, by looking at the, um, uh, you can form an omega chain um, uh, by iterating a function. And you can do something similar in a fibroid style by actually um, having a type that is dependent on an element of the initial uh, lifting algebra omega. Um, so there's many other axioms that you can impose, but I'm going to stop here um, for, for uh, the axioms of synthetic domain theory, because these are enough to, to do some work. Um, and we can, we can now use this, we can forget all the actual com com complicated semantic constructions that we use to show that there exist examples of this, and we can just use this as an informal meta language. Uh, for doing naive denotational semantics. And now it's going to start looking like it did in the beginning, but just a little bit more technical. So the context of a type now is a predomain. A program is just an ordinary function, um, but now in the Kleisley category. So it's an ordinary function from the predomain referred to by the context into the lift of the predomain referred to by the type. Um, or you can think of it as a partial function whose support lies in sigma. And um, you can form recursive functions using the completeness in the way that I just described. And now in assertion, it's just referring to an arbitrary subset, arbitrary subset. And then we'll have additional rules that apply when that subset is say closed under, these, um, uh, under the completeness condition that we described there for types. Um, and then entailments now again are just subset inclusions. So the nice thing about this story is that it scales effortlessly to many things that we want to do in programming languages, including recursive types, polymorphism, uh, first order store, which is, which is the ability to store in memory like things like integers and so on, um, finite non-determinism and, and therefore interleaving concurrency, which is uh, where you think of uh, a concurrent process as, as being uh, explained by all of the different, different paths that it can take, uh, all the different interleavings. Um, it's, 
I would say that other features like higher order store and um, uh, forms of, of concurrency that are um, th that violate the interleaving assumption um, are not well accounted for in this setting, however. And so this has led people to consider um, in a variety of directions, many different, uh, different options that deviate from this picture. Um, and so, that's well and good, but now you may, maybe you want to show that this actually relates to something that, that you already know. And um, the, the thing is that you, you can. Um, so you can show that if you prove something in, uh, in this uh, synthetic uh, domain theory, in this naive set theoretic style reasoning, it will, if you prove an equation, it will, it will actually deduce a correct observational or operational equivalence um, uh, between programs if you have an operational semantics already. Um, this, this property is called computational adequacy and there's um, uh, amazing uh, results um, from the 90s to the 2000s, um, first by, by Fiori and Plotkin and then later um, in a different style by Simpson, um, which show that uh, up to some very mild conditions, pretty much any model of synthetic domain theory will, will satisfy this adequacy property. Um, it, it's, you can come up with counter models, but, but they are very, um, they, they are very contrived. Um, and usually it involves like finding some kind of a size issue to, to obstruct computational adequacy. Um, and then uh, you can also prove the soundness of results proven synthetic domain theory for classical denotational semantics by constructing a model of synthetic domain theory using classical domains. And um, this, uh, um, I, 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 th I think Dana Scott actually um, uh, originally considered taking sheaves on a, on a traditional category of domains and then um, these kinds of embeddings into, into TOEFL were studied in much more detail by Fiori and Plotkin and Fiori and Rossellini. Um, and so this works really well as well. Um, you can even find um, axioms inside of uh, synthetic domain theory that will um, isolate the things that come from CPOs and things like that. So it's a very rich and powerful area. So that was one direction of domain theory, but something else was happening in parallel. Um, and I, I didn't realize how, for how long this was happening until recently. Um, uh, so, um, in the 19, 1980s, um, the Dutch School of Domain Theory was experimenting with a situation where you replace the CPOs and continuous maps with some kinds of metric spaces, some kinds of complete metric spaces and non-expansive maps. And the idea was that um, uh, contractive maps, contractive functions between these metric spaces and, and therefore um, locally contractive functors between them have unique fixed points. This is a really strong and remarkable property. Um, and uh, so you can, uh, I'll cite some of the literature here from, from those days that, that you can have a look at. Um, uh, the, um, this, uh, I would say in the mainstream programming languages community, this work was not so well known, but it uh, kind of suddenly became important um, to, uh, I guess, to American computer scientists when um, uh, Pell and McAllister introduced um, uh, some applications of something they were called step, calling step indexing. Um, I, I don't actually know who, who, who first did operational step indexing, maybe Andy will know. Um, uh, but they have this famous paper in which they show how to define a logical relation by, uh, that looks to be ill-founded, but they make it well-founded by having it be stratified in the finite unrollings um, of the recursive definition. And well, this is this uh, it doesn't look anything like metric domain theory, and it is uh, really uh, aesthetically different. Um, but you can make a technical connection to it, and I think this was extremely successful in the area of programming languages because it's extremely technically simple. You barely need to know anything to make it work. Um, so you can boot up a student working on this in ten minutes. Um, and uh, well, I think some people at the time thought, well, what's all this category theory for except for making more category theory? Um, and uh, it took many years to get to a point, I think, where it was clear that we needed to do some more category theory in order to actually scale to difficult problems. Um, that's a testament to how powerful the simple idea of step indexing was. Um, and of course, it yielded exceptionally strong results. Um, th these uh, operational step indexing uh, led to the solution to many open problems. Um, I think one of the most um, like shocking and um, like 
truly amazing uh, results in this area was Amal Ahmed's PhD thesis in 2004, in which she proved the semantic soundness of system F of ref, which is system F plus recursive types uh, plus uh, reference types for the higher order store. And so people, I think, could be forgiven for thinking that, um, you know, okay, semantics has come to an end. Now we will just do more of this. Um, and, uh, you know, something interesting happened um, in the, um, in the, uh, the 2000s, um, which was uh, some people noticed that you could make a new kind of synthetic domain theory using step indexing as the raw material, um, but throwing away the baggage of the operational semantics. Um, so here's roughly the idea. Um, so uh, there's a paper called First Steps in Synthetic Guarded Domain Theory in which they show that a complete bisected ultrametric space, which is the kind of uh, ultrametric space, kind of metric space that proves useful in these uh, step indexed uh, semantics, is actually a really simple thing. It's nothing more than a pre sheaf on the natural numbers with their standard order whose restriction maps are quotient maps. Um, so uh, the geometer is called these flabby pre sheets, I suppose. And um, not only is, is, is this the case, it's also the case that the inclusion into arbitrary pre sheets is co-reflective. So this is really stunning. And it led people to wonder if you could forget about these conditions, the flabbiness condition and these very bizarre, geometrically bizarre kinds of ultrametric space um, and just work with the pre sheets. Um, and so the idea of synthetic guarded domain theory is to find a new topos theoretic account of recursion in which in, rather than using like CPOs and, uh, as a base intuitions, instead we're using this, uh, these sort of step index sets as a basic uh, construct. Um, uh, so this has actually proved to be very successful. Um, so you can see some maximizations here. I will share my slides so you can click through the links there. Um, the, uh, the thing that distinguishes the new, this synthetic guarded domain theory from the traditional synthetic domain theory is um, uh, it is technically simpler in, in, in some senses. Um, so rather than having special class of, classes of objects that are defined by orthogonality conditions, um, we can actually just look at the entire topos. Um, so the things that deserve to be called predomains really have no extra condition on them whatsoever. Everything behaves like a predomain in synthetic guarded domain theory. Um, and so where does recursion come from? Well, if you think of a uh, pre sheaf on the order of the natural numbers, recursion comes from a, um, an operation that just uh, shifts, that, shifts that, pre um, that, that sequence of sets and replaces the, the last uh, element with the point. Um, and the idea is that um, if you have a function so the, if you have a function that uh, goes from uh, that operation applied to a pre-sheaf to the original pre-sheaf, then you can take some kind of a fixed point. Um, so this functor that does this weird thing, this shifting operation to the pre-sheaf is called the later modality um, in the setting. And then the domain is just the algebra for that endo functor. And then these domains are the things that you can actually do general recurs recursion on. But there's a new feature here, which is actually really important, um, which is that the universe, um, the internal universe inside the topos of all small predomains in the senses I've just described is a domain. And this is, this is very new. Um, in classical domain theory, you can classify certain kinds of domains like um, uh, certain kinds of algebraic domains by means of information systems. And there's a domain of information systems and so on. But it's, that's quite a different thing from classifying all the domains. Um, so this is a, this is a very uh, interesting and powerful feature that, um, that has come in handy. Um, so coming back to naive denotational semantics, um, where you think of programs as just functions inside a topos, um, it works. Um, the, the PhD thesis of uh, Marco Paviotti and some uh, joint work of his with um, Razas Murubar and uh, Lars Picadel um, develops uh, naive denotational semantics for general recursion in the topos language. Um, and so I think that's, that's quite a success of this language. Um, uh, you can extend this, in fact, to uh, general, uh, uh, in addition to general recursion, you can extend it to support parametric polymorphism and even higher order store. 
um, uh, with uh, semantic worlds. And now this is the result of Amal Ahmed um, in her PhD thesis from 2004, but now cast in a denotational setting. Um, so this, um, this was a uh, joint work with Dan Gretzer and Lara Spiegadale uh, last year. Um, and in fact, one of the benefits of looking in this topos theoretic way, which was really not easy to see if you were not thinking about it in terms of topoi, was that you can extend this model here almost effortlessly to a model of full dependent type theory with higher order store and parametricity and so on, and recursive types, in fact. Um, so I think that that is a, something that shows the power of this new synthetic domain theory. Um, and in fact, you can also build program logics um, that are very similar to state-of-the-art program logics uh, that people use um, in the operational setting. Um, but you can also build these in a denotational setting. Um, I see this as a return in some sense to the tradition of LCF um, uh, from, from the old days, um, where rather than reasoning about code in the proof assistant, you're instead reasoning about elements of the model. Um, and so I would say, uh, with, with with great respect to um, to Amal Ahmed, I would say I, this is my answer to her PhD thesis um, 20, 20 years later. Um, uh, so I, I think that um, uh, no history has not come to an end, and denotational semantics still has something to offer. So, what's next in this story? Um, we can do we can do some easy things. Um, we can we can have. Uh, interleaving concurrency and so on, non-determinism by means of uh, certain variations on the power domain construction that can be done in synthetic guided domain theory. Um, but I think in order to move beyond this and do things that, are, that pose real challenges, um, uh, both, for, uh, both for classical domain theory and for operational semantics, um, I think we need to broaden our horizons a bit. Um, and then not, uh, you know, declare our allegiance to any one particular domain theory. I'm thinking of true concurrency um, as an example. This is concurrency that uh, uh, violates the assumptions uh, um, of the interleaving model of concurrency. And, you know, in the era of relaxed memory, weak memory models and so on, um, uh, it seems important to develop this because computers, computers regularly violate. Actual physical computers do not preserve the axioms of interleaving concurrency. But in order to deal with this, we need to, I think, let go of this functional programming view and think more about um, uh, higher dimensional notions of space. Um, and then finally, I think the, maybe the biggest thing that we have to do is, is go, back to, go, go back to teaching. You know, the reason, the reason that operational methods have been so dominant, I think, in the past 20 years is that research has gotten faster, publications have gotten faster, and when you have a PhD student and you only have them for, you know, four years or you only have it for, for three years or something like that, it's hard to boot them up on something that is complex and, and semantically rich. But you can always boot, you can always boot them up on, uh, you know, inductive definition of operational semantics. I think that the kinds of problems that we're beginning to encounter now semantically, these are leading us to rethink this. Um, you know, the pendulum swings between uh, things that are easy but have low explanatory power and things that are hard but have high explanatory power. Um, so I'm interested in going in that direction, of course. Um, so I think that's actually all I'm going to say here, but so I hope there will be time for questions. But I also wanted to mention, I, I will be hiring a postdoc to work with me on uh, two-dimensional denotational semantics and things like that. And so if any of you uh, students who would be interested in such a position, or if, any, if you know someone who would, please get in touch with me. Uh, so I will uh, stop there and um, open it up for questions. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. That was very um, encouraging to know that the pendulum has swung uh, back to um, semantics, uh, categorical semantics side of things. and. Uh, I, I think we we will have uh, a lot of interesting questions. Um, so I think uh, uh, Dana has said that he has some questions. Dana, you can unmute yourself and and ask questions. Thank you, thank you, and thank you, uh, John, for this talk. I wished I could have given this talk, and so I'll ask you, how much are you going to uh, bill me for giving me this uh, foundational publicity here? Uh, because uh, the question is, can we? see to the future, and that's what the way you're pointing here. So thank you. Let me ask two questions. Back in the day, 
Alex Simpson had various reservations about synthetic domain theory. <clears throat> Do you think his reservations have been uh, overcome now, uh, looking back? And then the second question is, all the work of John Reynolds and his uh, collaborators <clears throat> is uh, very helpful. And uh, uh, isn't there more to do, <clears throat> for example, the abstract models of storage, isn't there more to do to uh, try to see how the simplest uh, uh, semantic foundation for that kind of thing can be given? So those are my two questions, one about Alex Simpson and one about John Reynolds and his collaborators. Well, thank you, Dana. Well, first of all, I think I think that you should be billing me because I feel that I'm just ripping off all of your ideas uh, mostly. But um, the um, so in regard to Alex Simpson, I haven't discussed this with Alex, but uh, I'm aware that he spent a lot of time trying to popularize synthetic domain theory, and um, it, it, many people consider his 2004 paper on computational adequacy as having, in some sense, closed the book on that topic. Although I'm not sure I would agree with that. Um, I think it was hard to sell um, uh, because this was in an, this was in an era where, where new and different ideas were, were arising, and maybe domain theory didn't feel as exciting um, to to people who were. Um, uh, we're um, uh, trying out a different approach. Um, I think we would have to ask Alex if he thinks, uh, if he still thinks that um, uh, synthetic domain theory um, have uh, reached uh, re reached a point at which its benefits were doubtful. Um, in regard to the work of John Reynolds and his collaborators like Frank Oles and others um, on uh, the structure of store, this has been one of the most interesting stories in PL for me because, um, you know, it, most PL people um, maybe don't know too much about, say, category theory or whatever, but, it, you know, if you say the word functor category semantics, you know, they'll know what that means because they remember John Reynolds' paper on that um, for uh, semantics of alcohol and so on. Um, I think that there's definitely a lot more to do. So if we go back and um, look at this uh, result that I pointed out, um, we're using structures that are very similar to the ones that um, that John Reynolds um, and his collaborators came up with uh, for doing functor category semantics of store. Um, the thing, though, is that in that work, they had this uh, these remarkable ideas about how to um, impose locality on the model of store, uh, where um, uh, you know, if you have a program that interacts with the memory in a way that doesn't affect the um, end result and no other program can see that part of the memory, so, so the program is its own local state there, uh, um, and that should be equal to a program that interacts differently with the memory in a way that is not observable. Um, and our model here, although it uses many of the ideas of John Reynolds and his collaborators, it does not satisfy that property. And in general, this is a big, this is part of a bigger problem about extensionality of denotational semantics and the by simulation of programs that interact with the heap in a different way. Um, and so I think that the horizon for this is um, in terms of improving on this and finding out what the structure that underlies these models is, there's a lot of room for improvement there for sure. Thank you. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Dana. And uh, I think we have uh, some questions, more questions. Uh, we have a question from Stanislav and then we have uh, Andrew uh, with his hands up. So uh, I'll ask Stan Stanislav's question first. Um, feel free to unmute yourself if you want to clarify your question. So the question is, um, are domain specific languages in programming an application of domain theory? That was the question from Stanislav. It's, it's a good question. Um, uh, from a superficial point of view, uh, the answer is that the use of the word domain in, in those two contexts is different. Um, but maybe we should make it the same um, in the sense that I think of synthetic domain theory as kind of a domain specific language for domain theory, if you catch my drift. Um, so. right, thank you, John and, and Stanislaw. Uh, now, yeah, Andrew, if you like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Yes, hi, hi, John. Yeah, uh, hi. kind of weird asking your question. I'm not actually sitting in an office next door to you, but uh, <laughs> we're not very far away from each other. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to get your views on on um, something that's become very, um, I, I've been sort of convinced of as, you know, an essential 
thing, which is the use of interactive theorem proving um, in connection with developing various kinds of mathematics. So here we're talking about synthetic domain theory. So one thing that slightly frustrates me is, is that we don't really have, I mean, so, you know, the, the base is elementary toposes, right? And so I, I would like to have, as it were, the standard proof assistant for the internal dependent type theory of elementary toposes, which you can kind of fudge in various existing systems. Um, but, um, but, you know, I mean, as you know, I mean, because yeah. it's, it's sort of extensional, it's in predicative, it's got various aspects. <laughs> um, so I wonder whether you could say something about what you think is, you know, the best tool at the moment in that respect. And and part two of my question is that uh, lurking here, right, with the, the stuff with um, in part two of your talk, right, is is modalities. And so you've yeah. got modal type theories. And I, I just... I, I don't know what the current state is with, um, you know, truly having something that assists you to develop stuff uh, yeah. involving modal type theory. Yeah. Yeah. So this is um, it, 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 it's it's actually a really hard problem. Um, so it's easy to have this kind of blithe like, oh, elementary topos equals modal type theory plus blah 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 blah. Um, but this is very distant from like actual workable implementation. And so many of us, you know, we work with, a, you know, either Koch or Agda or Lean, and we just add a bunch of axioms to it and then call it a day. If we're lucky, we can actually write down the axioms that we need in those systems. But it often happens, um, as, as uh, Andy is well aware, that sometimes you can't write the axioms down in, in the system because they involve something that doesn't make sense inside of type theory. And um, this kind of brings in the concept of modality. So yes, I think that right now we're actually very distant from a generic meta language, in particular because when people work informally with, say, the internal language of a topos, they are often um, passing between external and internal things um, in ways that are correct but are actually uh, not really allowed by the language. Um, correct if you're so, lucky. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you have to be very careful. Um, so uh, just to give an example. Um, uh, which has shown up in, in um, a lot of our work, including Andy's, is um, you have a topos of precious on a category, and then there's an object in that base category um, that uh, against which you can take binary products. Then the representable precious corresponding to that object is uh, is tiny, which means that its function space has a right adjoint, which you didn't expect it to have. But you can't just add that to type theory. If you add it to type theory, it leads to uh, well, something very bad will happen because when you add something naively to type theory, like a right adjoint to the function space, what's happening is you're not only asserting it for the topos, you're also asserting it for every slice of the topos. And then moreover, you're asserting it, you're asserting that it's actually preserved by base change between the slices of the topos. So in that sense, type theory is, is more like fibered category theory than category theory. Um, so these are things that many people have tried to come up with uh, more powerful type theories that allow you to incorporate these. Um, so one recent advance in this area um, is these multimodal type theories of um, Daniel Gretzer and his collaborators. And um, he's just written a very interesting thesis on this topic, which I recommend people to read. Um, but the kinds of modalities that are supported in uh, that um, system are still not all the ones that, that you would want. Um, so I think it really does remain in question uh, whether or not there can be a general type theoretic meta language for all these things. Um, so today, the you know the tricks of the trade are mostly organized around finding ways to avoid modalities that interact badly with type theory. Maybe we can always find a way to avoid those modalities, though. Um, the modality that most people think of is the box modality, which is a comonet that is not fibered in the type theoretic sense. Um, but uh, Mike Shulman pointed out years and years ago that you can simulate that by working in the scone of the uh, of the original topos, and then it becomes a monad that is fibered. Um, so maybe there's something that can be done, um, but I think the story is definitely not written there. Thank you, John, and thank you, Andrew. Um, so we have uh, David's hand is up, and then we also have a question from Steve uh, Audi. So David, um, maybe you can go first. Uh, um, I mean, you can unmute yourself. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, John. Um, thanks for the talk. Uh, at some point, you were talking about the um, 
uh, orthogonality with respect to the lift with respect to lifting like the initial algebra of mm -hmm. called omega or something into the terminal coalgebra yeah. is that can you um say does that does that condition for initial and terminal coalgebra lifting orthogonality does that condition often interesting and uh what does it mean in general do you know and what is it and then how do you take that general explanation and take it into the specific case and say what it's doing for you here I mean, I know what you said. It, it gives you the uh, yeah, gives you recursion, et cetera. But but maybe you could explain again. Sure. I mean, that's a very interesting question. Um, you know, in, in general, um, there's there's a story about um, about lifting that becomes much richer in um, in say like uh, higher dimensional settings. Um, so so for instance, um, if you have the um, if you have the say um, category of Category of, of categories and uh, co-continuous functors between the appreciated categories. This is like distributors and so on. Um, so this is the um, Cli relative Claisley bag category for the um, uh, appreciated relative monad and so on. And that's the kind of lifting. But now in this um, in this uh, by category, now you get a bunch of co-monads that correspond to different kinds of lifting which correspond to adding different kinds of co-limits of things. So maybe instead of adding all co-limits, you just added initial point, or maybe you add, you know, connected co-limits, you know, whatever. Um, and these all give rise to different kinds of um, uh, uh, lifting operations that, uh, you know, you can, you can tell similar stories to the, um, to the one we had here. I don't think anyone has ever tried to come up with like, you know, synthetic two domain theory, but that would certainly be an interesting question um, considering the wealth of different kinds of lifting that are available there. Um, here, the lifting is, is a, a relatively simple one. You just add an initial point to something that behaves like a pre-order or a poset. Um, and when you consider its initial algebra, well, that's just adding, you keep on adding that, uh, that initial point as many times as you want. And when you look at the final co-algebra, you're allowed to do that even forever. Um, and uh, when you can lift against that inclusion, um, what it allows you to do is it allows you to take a chain and uh, get an element that somehow comes from all the smaller elements there. And it does it in a unique way. Right. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. And thank you, David. Um, so I have a question from Steve Aldi. Um, I'll ask on his behalf because the internet's a bit unstable. So uh, his question is uh, that uh, the universe of domains being a domain is a cool new feature. It's the sort of thing we have in the models of hot uh, homotopy type theory that we have been trying to study, that we've both been studying. Are some of these ideas coming in here or is the construction unrelated? Um, yeah, well, thank you, Steve, for that question. Um, uh, I, I think that it's very closely related. Um, so I, I believe this observation about the universe being a later algebra in synthetic guarded domain theory was um, uh, due to Razas Murlbo and Lars Bikadil in a paper in which they were considering models of synthetic guarded domain theory um, based on models of intentional type theory, like um, you know categories of vibration and so on. Um, and in that setting, they indeed um, use a univalent universe in that model um, and show that it's a domain. Um, so yeah, I think I think like this, you know, this last like 15 years of type theory has almost been a, like a real golden age of ideas coming back together from different areas. Um, and homotopy type theory has definitely played a decisive role in that process. Thanks, John. Thanks, uh, Steve, also for your question. And uh, Harrison, your, your, your hand is up. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Eric. Yes. Uh, thanks for a great talk, John, um, as always. I had two quick questions that I wanted to ask. The first one is you were talking about how you have recursive types in this topos. Uh, does this give you like recursive dependent types and indexed uh, indexed types and everything like this? Mm. That's a good question. Um, you know, the, the answer is, is no, um, or at least it doesn't give you all of them. Um, there's a lot of types that um, in the topos that are not pre-domains. Um, and uh, you can't expect to, to do some kind of recursive construction among them. Um, so in general, pre-domains are closed under, under pi, uh, pi types. Uh, so you can have family of pre-domains, you can take its dependent product, doesn't matter what's indexed by. 
but they're not going to be closed under sigma types, except for the very, 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 very special families, uh, families that have some kind of a continuity condition. Um, so overall, I think the, the question of um, extending synthetic domain theory in the classic sense to full dependent type theory is more of a, a matter of full embedding rather than a matter of, you know, the whole type theory is domain theory. Thanks. Thanks, John, and thanks, Harrison. Um, so there are actually a lot of questions also on YouTube, and usually I don't have, we don't have time for fielding them, but I, I, um, I, I think they're interesting questions. So I'm, um, John, I, I'll, I hope it's okay. I'm going to ask some of those sure. questions here. Uh, so we have a, one of the questions uh, says uh, regarding your your slide on on metric spaces. Uh, can you also view a metric space as a Lovier metric space? Can you right. So there's this perspective as uh, metric spaces as as enriched uh, categories, and um, so there is indeed a uh, analogous definition of ultra metric space in terms of an enriched category. The enrichment is different, but um, it, it also looks. Thank you. And um, there was one one more question from YouTube, and that's uh, that uh, how do you use sheep semantics to model non-interference properties of programs? Right. Um, so I think the question refers to a paper that um, that I um, wrote with Bob Harper a couple of years back. Um, roughly, the idea is um, uh, if you have a um, a pre-order or a post set. Um, whose elements correspond to, um, uh, say, security clearances or security levels or something like that. The internal logic of the topos um, of pre-sheaves on that thing um, uh, has modalities um, uh, that correspond to each security level. There's an open modality and a closed modality. The open modality restricts you into the world that can only be seen by people at that security level. Or, excuse me, it restricts you into the world that what remains of the world after you have classified everything that these people are not allowed to see. So if you have a low security level, it, it you can only see things that are public. Um, the closed modality does the other thing. It, it kind of takes you into the world of, of people who are who are allowed to, to look at things. Um, and um, there's a non-interference property where if you have a, a function from a um, high security data to a low security data, um, uh, this function uh, has to be constant. Um, and uh, so non that's a non-interference property. And this falls out directly immediately from the definitions of the open and closed modalities as, as exponentials and pushouts or joins respectively. Now, what the termination insensitivity part has to do with this is that now if we want to have a language that has recursion, we need to do this, but with domain theory. So instead of looking at pre sheaves you're looking at some kind of pre sheaves of domains or something like that. We do this by making a model of synthetic domain theory that's um, uh, a relative topos or a bounded topos over this pre sheaf topos of uh, um, security clearances. And in that setting, termination matters. You can have programs that maybe terminate or don't terminate. And so what turns out to be true in that model is that a partial function from a high security information to low security information, it is either so it, it doesn't have to be completely constant. It can be just constant on its support, meaning that by virtue of the, uh, of the secure classified information, it might diverge even, uh, but it cannot release some bits. Um, and so that's this termination and sensitivity. So it's an interesting property of that model of synthetic domain theory. Thank you so much, John. Thanks for answering those questions. And I are there, are there any more, any more questions from the audience? Um, the Zoom, the, raise your hand or type them in the chat. Okay. Um, well, John, I really enjoyed today's talk. I thank you for sharing your the, this beautiful talk. Just a lot of really good ideas in there. A lot of beautiful relationships, and and uh, I think uh, the audience really enjoyed that. So let's uh, thank John again. And also thank you for, for answering our questions. And uh, uh, to, so to the audience, uh, we are gonna be posting John's slides on, on the Topos Colloquium website. Uh, if you can check it out later, uh, once we get the slides, we'll post it there. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you all for your time. And thanks once again, John, for, for, for uh, uh, giving a talk in our, in our Colloquium. And uh, 
Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Going to end the live stream now. Bye, John. Thank you very much.